I want to welcome everybody. Um, I'm Matt Garcia. Uh, I am the Richard and Ralph Lazarus Professor of History and Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean Studies. I'm also the Chair of Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean Studies here at Dartmouth. Um, this has been uh, a joy for me. It has been somewhat of a dream for me um, since actually coming to Dartmouth um, to host both Heather and Ann Thompson and Stanley Nelson um, and to focus our attention on Attica and its legacy. It's been a two-day two affair. Um, last night, some of you did see the film um, over in Lowell. Low, excuse me, um, and um, this is a rare opportunity where we have a film, uh, an, an Academy Award nominated film, um, and, an, and, and an amazing film with the director, and then to have the historical consultant, the person that wrote the book on Attica, follow that film with us um, in the same visit. Um, so this entire uh, project started with uh, Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean studies proposing to the Rockefeller Center that we uh, do this work, um, largely because Nelson Rockefeller was so instrumental in the history of Attica, and you're going to hear more about that today. You certainly saw it last night. So I just want to thank um, Jason Barabas, the director, um, and then um, Joanne Blaze, um, who have been terrific in terms of supporting um, this program. And so um, we think it's consequential. We think it's a, a central question to uh, public policy um, in our region and in our, in our country. And, and it's a lesson to be learned from. Um, so it's been great partnering with them. It's also been, partner, it's been wonderful partnering with uh, African, African American studies, um, specifically Trika Keaton, um, who was instrumental in helping us to um, bring Stanley on and um, to propose that we do this, this pairing. So it's, it's been really rewarding to work with uh, AAAS. Um, and uh, um, the last uh, group, or, or I guess uh, department, would be history that has been um, uh, great uh, ally to work with, um, also my home department. Beyond that, we um, got support from the associate dean, uh, Matt Delmont, um, who saw the relevance of this programming and was uh, happy to support it. Um, film and Media Studies also supported the film last night. Um, and then the Ethics Institute um, has been uh, an incredible supporter. So all of these entities at Dartmouth um, have been de deeply invested in this program. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to them for their support, as well as uh, my colleague and my partner, Desiree Garcia, um, who uh, led the um, discussion last night and lent her classroom. Actually, was, uh, her class, Race and Gender uh, in Film, um, was the venue that you were sitting in last night for the film. Um, so we will be joined again by uh, Stanley Nelson, um, the director of Attica. Um, I gave um, a more thorough introduction last night. I just want to remind you that this is um, a film that comes after a long line, a, a huge body of film um, that um, is, is so vast that I, I can't uh, really do it justice in presenting here. But um, some of the greatest hits, um, he had the, the murder of Emmett Till in 2003. Um, and he had in 2006, Jonestown, The Life and Death of People's Temple. Um, in 2019, Miles Davis, Davis, Birth of Cool. And then in 2021, um, Attica, um, for which he was nominate, nominated for Academy Award and also uh, won the Directors Guild of America Award for that uh, film. Um, he's made films for five decades, um, and he is also the vaunted MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, recipient in 2002. Um, with that support, um, he's built uh, a very important support structure in New York, um, Firelight Media Documentary Lab that began in 2009 with his wife, Marcia Smith, that supported over 100 filmmakers um, over the last decade, including a film that was also nominated the same year um, as Attica um, that came out of that project, um, Ascension, by um, a Chinese-American filmmaker, uh, Jessica Kingdon. So 
We'll be joined um, by Stanley um, in the Q&A to talk about Attica. Um, but it is my great privilege now to uh, welcome and introduce Heather Ann Thompson. Um, Heather and I go way back to the days of Detroit when I was doing research on a book about Cesar Chavez. There's a whole story of why that uh, archive is in Detroit. It has everything to do with Wayne State. But that's also the home of labor history. And um, Heather is uh, known for a lot of things, urban history, but also labor history and Detroit history. And so it was there where we forged a friendship and uh, um, known about her work for a very long time. She's also a native Detroiter, and so she's happily um, a professor of history and African American study in her home state at the University of Michigan. She is the author of Blood in the Water, the Attica Prison Uprising of 1971 and its Legacy, which won the Pulitzer Prize in History in 2017 and the Bancroft Prize for the best book in American history and diplomacy that same year. The book also won five other awards and was a finalist for the National Book Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Award, and the Cundell Book Award. Heather's uh, known for um, her work in urban, history, urban American history, um, best demonstrated in her book, um, Who's Detroit? Politics, Labor, and Race in a Modern American City, that was published in 2001 which was recently rep uh, republished in 2017 on the 50th anniversary of the De Detroit Rebellion of 1967. Uh, Since the publication of Blood in the Water, she has emerged as a leading voice and scholar on the history of policing, mass incarceration, and the COVID crisis, appearing regularly in newspapers and on television. This work demonstrates the confluence of scholarship and activism at the core of her practice as a historian, which is manifest in the form of scholarly articles that challenge us to rethink our nation's approach to justice and corrections today. This work includes the publication, Why Mass Incarceration Matters, Rethinking Crisis, Decline, and Transformation in the Postwar United States in the Journal of American History, and rethinking working class struggle through the lens of the carceral state towards a labor history of inmates and guards in labor studies in working class history of the Americas. Is also, uh, she is also involved in policy work, including her work on the National Academy of Sciences Blue Ribbon Panel that studied the causes and consequences of mass incarceration in the US. She told me today she was the first historian actually to participate in this um, and is the co-founder of Carceral State Project that includes the Documenting Criminalization and, Con and Confinement Research Initiative funded by the Arts for Justice Fund. If this is not enough, she's personally taken on the states of New York and Illinois uh, in a lawsuit to give inmates access to blood in the water and to fight censorship of the book by both states. Litigation is pending, so she is limited on what she can say about this today. But if you want to learn more, the New York Times has written about her, uh, her ongoing struggle um, in the past year. So look it up. In every way, Heather has shown us the power and hope that resides in the act of doing research and telling moving, accessible history. I'm proud to be a historian because of her and so pleased to share her brilliance with you, especially at Dartmouth, where Nelson A. Rockefeller's legacy looms so large. It's time for a, re a critical reevaluation of this history, so I'll turn over the podium to Heather. So welcome, Heather. Thank you so, so much, Matt. That's what an incredibly generous uh, introduction. I so appreciate that, especially coming from you. As Matt says, we go way, way back. And so this is a real honor for me to be here. And I really want to thank the Rockefeller Center, all the departments that helped support this and made this possible. And I'm absolutely also thrilled to have 
uh, Stanley Nelson here to share this time with him. Um, you know, it's a dream of historians to team up with filmmakers because that allows us both to do storytelling in the ways that we do, but also uh, kind of build off of the power of storytelling in a different way. And it's been, um, you know, for the last, ever since the film came out, it's really been a, a pleasure to, to know Stanley. And I'm, I'm so glad that so many of you got to see the film last night, which remains, in my view, uh, one of the most stunning documentaries that one can spend time with. And um, no matter how many times you see it, uh, it moves you just as much, which is really extraordinary. So thank you, Stanley. I'm really glad you're here as well. Um, so I want to uh, do something which is uh, it's sort of the unenviable task of coming after such an amazing film and trying to say, well, now listen to the historian. Uh, <laughs> I promise you that I will not bore you, or at least I will promise to try to not bore you, uh, because I want to tell you uh, about a different, just some different pieces about Attica that uh, you might not have learned about last night. Um, before I do that, though, I want to first set up why it is that I think that we should all actually care about this story beyond uh, the obvious reasons, which is a reckoning with the past and honoring of tremendous uh, suffering and struggle that went on in that D yard so many years ago. And that is the real conviction that I have that something about this story tells us a lot about where we are today and therefore we need to understand it in its complexity. I think it really helps us to make sense of where we are today. And what do I mean by where we are today? Because we are in a lot of places right now <laughs> that are a little head scratching to be, to be honest. But what I'm specifically talking about is how we became the world's largest incarcerator. How it is that we came to lock up more people than any other country on the planet? And uh, not just to lock up more people, but to do so in these incredibly important political bursts where we get this sign, this indication that uh, the, the political system is growing increasingly conservative in really kind of alarming ways and uh, very precipitously, it seems, when one looks at the graph of incarceration. And we're not just talking about the fact that we become the world's largest incarcerator. We are talking about not just incarcerating anybody. We are talking about talking, incarcerating more people than any other country and having the most racialized incarceration of any other country. I picked 2004 just as a very important date to show you some of what these graphs look like about just how, how deeply racialized the system is. 2004, because that is really at kind of the height, the, the real zenith of so much of the carceral crisis, we're still in it but we at least begin after 2004 to make some real important grassroots efforts to try to beat it back. But in 2004, you can see that it is not just anybody who's among the two, more, two plus million people locked up, but it is disproportionately uh, people of color. And if you were to get a sense of just how disproportionately you look at what the American racialization is compared to South Africa at the height of apartheid, and you get the sense of how deeply out of step we are, how deeply racist our prison system is. That's the graph on the bottom right. And we need to be really clear. Uh, I don't need to tell you, but I feel like in, when I'm giving this talk in small towns across America, we also need to be really clear that this racialization has absolutely nothing to do with crime. Not crime the way we imagine crime to be. If you just take the drug war that has landed so many people there, you learn some really interesting facts really clearly, which is that white people both use and sell more drugs than anyone else. If you look at the marijuana arrest rates in any one of our major, major counties across this country, the staggering disproportionality between who gets arrested for marijuana and even in those states where there's been legalization, who remains behind bars in so many of these states because of marijuana arrests. You have no uh, illusion that this is just about mass incarceration. This is about hyper-racialized mass incarceration. 
What is even more kind of alarming about this is that we were sold a false bill of goods. We didn't have to do this. People think we did this because the crime rate was out of control in the 60s. In fact, historians were some of the worst culprits contributing to this idea that the reason we ended up here is because crime gets out of control in the 60s. Well, one of the things that I do is I go back and actually historicize, is that true? Turns out not true. The homicide rate was uh, as low as it had been since 1911. Uh, you look at the violent crime rate and you learn something really interesting, which is that violent crime rates go through the roof after we get knee deep into mass incarceration. And that's in part because mass incarceration destroys communities. Mass incarceration tears at the social fabric. What does this have to do with why you're here? Well, if you look at this graph of mass incarceration, you'll notice that it goes precipitously up in terms of who we incarcerate. But what you can't perhaps really see is exactly when this happens. We stay really, really consistent. And then it's actually about 1972 that we start a dramatic, dramatic upward spiral of incarceration. By the way, we'd been involved in the war on crime, quote unquote. Lyndon Johnson declares the war on crime, 1965. So it takes a while before all of a sudden we really, really invest in mass incarceration. And I want to suggest to you that Attica is ground zero for understanding this story. There's other ground zeros for understanding the story, but Attica is a really important one. So now we get to the more storytelling part. This is Blood in the Water. This is the book that I wrote on this subject. The book took 13 years to write. And it's not because, as Trevor Noah asked me on The Daily Show, is this because you type like this? No, it's not. It's because the state of New York still to this day holds all of the archives back. You cannot find just the traditional archives that historians would normally go to. So this was a journey of finding out who has the copy, who has the original, who will talk to me, where can I find this? And ultimately, the story comes together when I happen upon a cache of records up in upstate New York, which we could talk about later if you're interested in that story. The story that I want to tell you, I'll tell you the beginning part that you already know if you saw the film. So I'll go through this quickly. The story begins in upstate New York, which is a very small, small town called Attica. It's right off the New York Thruway, not something that you'd particularly even notice. You, you're on your way, probably the closest big small town near it is Batavia, New York. You go through this town, it's a tiny town, you know, the, this little slice of, you know, it seems like Norman Rockwell's kind of Americana. Uh, and then you get just outside of the town and you see this behemoth of a structure that was built during the Great Depression. And it looks just like it did back in the Depression. It has these massive walls, this massive fortress. It sits, so it, it has these exercise yards that you're seeing in the squares up there. And this really forbidding place was filled with young men overwhelmingly from downstate, from New York City and its boroughs, but also from some of the poorest neighborhoods in Rochester, in Buffalo, and in Syracuse. What this place looks like in 1971 is deeply alarming. It's not unique in many ways. All maximum security prisons in 1971 are brimming full with people who are poor, who are suffering the PTSD of Vietnam, having just come home, people who have been arrested for their activism outside of the prison walls, and people who end up there for all of the complicated reasons that people end up in prison. But the problem was this prison was run so brutally, so inhumanely, and the problem was also that the guards who worked in this prison who were, by the way, working class white kids who end up in this prison because there's no other jobs and because they, some of them have come back from Vietnam with nothing to do, who are not trained, don't know anything about working in a prison. They're thrown together in this place, and it is extremely toxic. These are people who have been fed on 63 cents a day. These are people who have horrendous medical care, lose all their teeth because there's no dental care, can't get mail from their loved ones if it's in Spanish, can't see 
their uh, partners unless they're married to them, can't see their children if they're not married to the mothers of those children. Uh, the list goes on and on. There's capricious cap parole rules. There's capricious rules for everything. It's common to end up locked up in your cell indefinitely. It's common to end up in HBZ block, the notorious segregation unit. And through all of this, it's not just the prisoners who know something's wrong. The guards know there's something wrong, too. They are telling their union reps, <clears throat> this place is a powder keg. It's a tinder keg. How do they know this? Because what the men on the outside of their, you know, once they get on the outside of their cells, they are organizing in the yard. They're, these people are the same Black Panthers outside or inside, the same Young Lords Party members outside or inside. They are organizing, they're thinking, and they actually have some faith that they've got some rights, some human rights, even though they are serving time. And they want this place to be run more humanely. Interestingly, though, they don't go about this by just taking over the prison. They begin by writing letters to the commissioner of correction, by sending letters to their state senator, basically saying, do something. And they actually say, we want to do this democratically. We want you to just come in here and do something to fix this place, right? We need better doctors. We need Spanish-speaking guards. We need better food. We need to have better conditions in general. And it just falls on deaf ears. And the guards are saying, hey, you know, this place is about ready to blow up. You better do something. And their warnings fall on deaf ears. These are, again, untrained guards. They're working overtime. They're, they're, I tell you what, untrained guards are scared guards. And scared guards are dangerous guards. And so you've got all of this going on, and nobody does anything. And as you know from the film on September 9th, everything explodes. It's not so important why, but what you should know is it all really starts not because someone has planned it, not because it's been brewing as a master plan, a diabolical plan, but rather because management makes a very ill-fated decision to lock two, two teams, essentially two companies coming back from the mess hall in this hall, doesn't tell the guards what they're doing, doesn't tell the prisoners what they're doing. Everyone's terrified, everyone's fearful. They start backing up, everything starts exploding. And then a gate comes down, and the next thing you know, it's a free-for-all. It begins, in many respects, as a riot. And I don't use that word lightly. I mean chaos. I mean people are terrified. People are grabbing guards to, to protect themselves. People are beating each other up. It's a, it's a scary, scary situation. But then cooler heads prevail. Because there had been organizing, and they tell everybody, move out to the one yard, the yard farthest away from the front of the prison, DR, and they say, we've got, this is an opportunity. We can tell the world what life is like inside of Attica. We can tell people what we need. And they quickly organize, and they elect representatives to speak for them out of each cell block. And they have make sure that there's representatives from all the most important political groups in the yard. And everything that they say up in the front of the yard is being translated into Spanish, so Spanish-speaking prisoners can also understand what's going on. And these guys ask for observers to come in, observers such as Tom Wicker of the, oh, let me, let me back up and say, and they do take hostages. They take hostages because they are very aware that without hostages, they are, they're going to just be wiped out, right? The state's just going to come in, and that's going to be the end of it. So they take hostages, but they surround them with two rings of prisoners to make sure they are protected. They give them mattresses. They feed them first. They have every interest in keeping these hostages alive and treating them well. The injured hostages from all that earlier chaos, they get out to make sure that they have had medical care. And then they ask for people to come up to the medical tent down here on the right if they need care. They ask for people to come up and get medicine if they need medicine. They work at a food distribution system. It is a virtual and incredible, as you saw in the film, tent city. People are protecting each other, taking care of each other. And into this mix on the outside, you've got a whole lot of angry, worried, terrified, and angry townspeople not having any idea what is going on on the inside. All they know is that their loved ones are hostages and the prison is under the control of the prisoners. 
But what does that really mean? Well, it means that the first thing they do is they ask for these observers to come in, including Tom Wicker of the New York Times, Clarence Jones of the Amsterdam News, people that you got to see in the film last night, and Bill Kunstler, famed Marxist lawyer who was defending lots of activists in this time period. And they want observers like this because they want someone to make sure that if there's going to be any negotiations with the state, that everyone negotiates in good faith and that they are being well represented outside the prison walls. Make no mistake about it, the state also puts its own observers on the so-called observer committee. So the observer committee ends up being quite diverse of political opinion. It has state senators on there. It has a US congressman on there, Herman Badillo. It has uh, Republicans, Democrats, radical leftists. It's got everybody on it. But over time, the one thing that this group becomes very committed to doing is making sure that the state will negotiate with these prisoners to come to a good resolution, get to this issue of what conditions are like on the inside. And so negotiations begin. And it's extraordinary because the world watches. There are media outlets that are filming inside of this prison. And people on the outside, really interestingly, are kind of fascinated by this because this is a moment, by the way, when this country has already decided we're going to have a moratorium on the death penalty. We are going to start thinking about decarceration, maybe more community corrections, community um, mental health, for example, instead of these big warehouses that are so horrific. We're in kind of a moment here in 1970 where people are sort of like, wow, I mean, let's listen. What do these guys have to say? And I'm talking about the general kind of public. And so every night they're turning on to the news. What's going on? What's going on in Attica? And these negotiations go on for four long days and nights. And they're really productive negotiations. Ultimately, the guys whittle down what are their demands going to be. And there's you know, 30 plus demands. And ultimately, the state comes to agreement on 28 of them. And people are feeling kind of good about it. People are feeling like maybe there could be some resolution. And then in the middle of this, just when things feel like it's going to be OK, a guard who had been in that melee on that first day, the one whose keys get taken from him, the father of the woman you saw in the film, D. Quinn Miller, ends up dying of the injuries to his head. And when that happens, the men inside are terrified because they know that now every one of them could be on the hook for felony murder. And a demand that they had had on the table that was really important becomes critically important. And that is that they will have amnesty if they surrender. Let's come to an agreement. We will have it. They didn't say you couldn't necessarily investigate this murder. They just said you can't wholesale charge everybody. They were terrified of wholesale criminal charges, and they were also terrified of getting very badly hurt because there had been other previous uprisings in this time period in New York where the response of the retaking had been vicious. So they were scared. They wanted amnesty. They were also scared because they could see in the observer's eyes that there was a lot to be scared about. They can see troopers who are on their roofs looking in at them. They can see that they're being monitored by the police. They don't quite understand actually how bad it was. The FBI is on the scene literally planting rumors, literally in there getting the pot, stirring the pot. These are sending teletypes all the way up to the president, the vice president, the CIA, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines. This is, by the way, a small town in upstate New York. But everybody in law enforcement is there watching this because they think that this is the black power takeover of the century, right? But what the observers can see that these guys cannot is what looks like outside. And what it looks like outside is terrifying. Because while these same four days and long nights of negotiations have been going on, every single state trooper battalion from across New York has descended on Attica. They are outside of the prison. They are there the entire time. They've had no sleep. They have had absolutely a diet, if any, of being you know, fueled by these rumors that the FBI is on the scene encouraging. These are men who absolutely already have deeply racialized feelings about anyone that would come from <laughs> you know, downstate New York, let alone into the prison. 
and they are itching to get inside. They are mad that the Commissioner of Corrections is negotiating in the first place. They want this thing to end. They want to get in immediately. But here's what's really terrifying. They are passing out weapons like candy. Nobody's writing down serial numbers. In fact, the one guy, the one hapless trooper who's kind of trying to keep order, like who's taking what, is basically told, rip it up. People are bringing their own weapons from home, their deer rifles, they are loading up all the weapons they have with ammunition outlawed by the Geneva Convention, deer slug bullets, a horrendous cocktail of ammunition. And they are demanding entrance, basically. They want to get in. But again, the observers are there for a reason. You can't just necessarily go in when you've got a congressman in there and you know, you've got some of the highest profile reporters from the New York Times in there and you know they this whole you know slow down a little bit. So the presence of the observers and the attention from the media and the world bought people a lot of time. And there was still a faith that these negotiations could result in something positive. And so much so that the observers actually go to the man, the one who can make this settle. And that's Nelson Rockefeller. Nelson Rockefeller was the governor of New York then. And he had a very complicated reputation in the state. On the one hand, he was known as one of the most liberal Republicans around. And many people liked him for that reason. On the other hand, this was a man whose own party was becoming increasingly conservative. It was becoming a law and order party. And Nixon was in the White House. And the truth was that Nelson Rockefeller had made a few bids for the presidency. He wanted to be the president. And one of the things that was very clear in the party was to, to be a Republican in 1971, you had to show your law enforcement bona fides. You had to be really clear where you were on this question of the war on crime. But still, you've got 40 state employees there being held and you've got all of these imprisoned people, and negotiations are going on, and you've got all these high-profiled observers. So the observers think, let's appeal to this guy. He could be reasonable. Some of them knew him well. Uh, Clarence Jones you know, considered that he had a pretty good relationship with Rockefeller, felt he was someone he could talk to. Tom Wicker had felt like he'd interviewed him before. He felt like, this is a man we could talk to. And one of the other observers, John Dunn, was a Republican state senator who talked to him all the time. He was on the Crime Commission. So they called him. They called him on the phone. And they basically said, Mr. Governor, we basically beg of you. You've got to come to Attica. Because first of all, you really need to give amnesty. I can't do that. I can't do that. And he said, but you've got to come to Attica. And he demurs, he says, ah, you know, not a good idea. No, I, I, you know, no, thank you for offering, basically, but no, I can't do that. And they said, let's be clear. They minced no words. If you don't come, <laughs> a massacre is likely to occur. And we, whatever happens, we have to keep these negotiations going on. And he just sort of says, you know, great, you know, as all the men report later, you know, he's very friendly about it. He's very nice about it, but he makes it clear he's not coming. And they even say to him, you don't even have to go in the prison. Just stand outside and ensure these guys that, you, that they will not be harmed if they surrender. They will not be indiscriminately prosecuted. Give them a way to end this. We've already come to 28, agreement on 28 points. No. He won't come. And so then the Observer Committee issues a statement to the public because they hope then that they will basically, in turn, lean on the governor to come. And if you read the statement really carefully, they are clear. They are crystal clear because they can see outside of the prison what the prisoners themselves cannot even see, which is this. Again, this incredible kind of orgy of passing out weaponry from these trucks and furious, and even the observers are starting to feel this hostility, particularly the black observers, are feeling the hostility of these troopers. And so everybody's waiting on tenterhooks, not knowing what is gonna happen. And then something happens that I don't think that I even fully appreciated kind of the kind of horror of it until I happened upon a very specific document and that is that 
everybody is telling Rockefeller, do not go into this prison with force, including the head of the army and his closest advisors. And they are clear, I find out years later, they are clear, if you go in here, hostages will be killed. And he's even talked out of going in on Sunday by John Dunn, who says, give them a chance. We've got to do this. We've got to negotiate this. And on the fifth morning, everything goes to hell in a handbasket. And the behind the scenes of how that happens is just chilling. Because on that morning, the state sends its guys to the A gate, where they'd gone every morning. And this, the same dance was done that was done every morning. We need you to surrender. We need you to let the hostages go. We need you to go to your people, find out, you know, can, are, are we ready to end this thing? And in this case, Richard Clark and a few others in the prison, they realize, eh, this feels a little different, but okay, we'll take it back. We'll take it to a vote. And they, like all things in the yard, very much concerned with democracy, so they take it to a vote. Are we ready to give up? And an over-resounding no. We still want negotiations to happen. And so they think negotiations are happening, are still going to happen. And the chilling document is the one that showed that they were told, the kind of people at the gate were told, whatever you do, do not make it clear that this is an ultimatum. In other words, they thought negotiations were still going on because that was the plan. And so they go back, they say, you know, thanks, but no thanks. We're close, we're going to continue these negotiations. And then it's really quiet. People start to get really nervous because they look around and like, oh, well, the, the sharpshooters aren't on the roof anymore, and it's really quiet. And the, and the observers have not come down today, and people start to get really scared. And then a helicopter comes over, and it kind of flies reconnaissance over the yard. But even here, like, kind of a cheer goes up because some people who remarkably have faith in the system at this point still think maybe it's Rockefeller coming. Maybe he's actually coming to the prison. And countless prisoners testified to this later that, yeah, they really thought maybe Rockefeller was. But then, the, then it leaves. It just flies over, and then it's gone. And then sheer panic sets in. Right? Because then it's clear something terribly wrong is about to happen. And so they put in plan something, an ill-fated plan to be sure, but one that they had talked about, and in fact, one that they made clear to the guards was the plan, which is that they were going to take some of the guards from the hostage circle, and they were going to take them up on these catwalks that overlaid these yards, and they were going to surround each of the prisoner, each of the guards with these kind of makeshift weapons, and you kind of saw this also in the film, and the plan is a last-ditched effort to be sure, but it kind of makes sense, which is if, you th if, if this whole helicopter comes back, if you think that you know, you're going to just be harming us, make no mistake about it, you're going to be harming these people too, right? And, but up on the catwalk, what's going on is much more complicated than that. I mean, in the book, I take you into this conversation between this guard, Mike Smith, and Don Noble, this prisoner, and they had worked together in the metal shop. And Mike Smith was a really interesting guard because he actually was, you know, kind of young, kind of longish hair. They kind of felt he was going to kind of hip for a guard. And he actually had encouraged them to write those first letters to Oswald. He had, he's like, look, you guys just want basic stuff, man. It makes sense to me. Like, he was kind of on their side. And they're up there. He and Don are up there, and they are terrified. And they tell the story. I mean, basically, Mike is saying to Don, like, Don, man, if I don't get out of here, like, in my back pocket, I got a note that I wrote to my wife, Sharon. Can you make sure that she knows I love her? And then Don kind of shares similar information with him. And, and they're terrified. And then Mike says that he can hear the sounds first of a helicopter, and then he can feel it. He can feel the concussion in his chest. And another helicopter comes over, and it starts dumping these canisters of CN and CS gas, which, you know, you've heard of tear gas. It's like, doesn't sound so bad, tear gas, whatever. Go home, wash out your eyes. No, this is a powder, and it 
these canisters explode and it is getting in everyone's eyes and in their nose, down their throats, and they are retching and they are sick and they are vomiting and blinded. And you saw in Stanley's beautiful film how it just mows people down. And it is when they are mowed down, it is when they are already incapacitated that over 300 troopers head out onto the catwalks with guns blazing. And you can hear in the film how much these guns are blazing. And what also goes on, as you know, is the sound of a helicopter, the first helicopter, going around and around and saying again and again, surrender with your hands up and you won't be harmed. Surrender with your hands up and you won't be harmed to the sound of da 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 And within 15 minutes, it is an utter bloodbath. It is stunning, even to some of the troopers who were its worst offenders making it happen. It was stunning to the men who thought that someone might come in, but they're going to come in with billy clubs. You know, that's the way you always end a prison riot. You come in with clubs. They were ready to do that kind of battle if need be, but not this. And in the end, 39 men. 10 guards, 29 prisoners are shot to death. But here's the thing. That's not what the American people are told. That, they don't know what's just happened. They don't know that 10 guards have been killed, and they don't know that 29 guards have been killed, not from some pitched heavy battle, but because they've been shot to death. And in fact, the head of the New York Department of Corrections steps out in front of the prison. And mind you, it's packed because you got the media there from all over the world. You got all the townspeople there. You got everybody there. You got the families now of incarcerated people who've tried to show up but are kind of also terrified to be there with the kind of venom in, in, in this space. And they say, well, what happened was the prisoners killed the hostages. And not only did the prisoners kill the hostages, they said, but one of them castrated one of the guards. And you know what else? Shoved his testicles in his mouth. What a disgusting animal. And you know what else? Three of the, prisoner, the guards were already dead, buried in the yard. And the media is like, what? You know, you know, really? Yes, we've got film. We've got evidence of this. And they're all like writing it down. And the next thing you know, on the front page of the New York Times, big headlines. These barbaric prisoners have assassinated, killed their helpless hostages. If you read this one in particular, it reflects a barbarism, wholly alien to civilized society. Prisoners slash the throats of utterly helpless, unarmed guards whom they'd held captive, increasingly revolutionary set of demands. This is the New York Times. The LA Times, same thing. This went out on the front page of every newspaper in America because it went out on the UPI and the AP, which meant that it just went out as the story. So whether you were in you know, Lebanon, New Hampshire, or whether you were in you know, Gastonia, North Carolina, this is what you were told. And it was a lie. Didn't happen. And in fact, what was happening was that the shooting was just the beginning of the horror. And I'm going to spend a, spend a very little time on these next slides. But what ends up then happening is sheer and unadulterated terror and torture for these men for the subsequent days, weeks, and months. These men have absolutely nobody inside of this prison to see what's happening. They are being tortured. And outside, medics are trying to get in. A whole busload of black doctors and nurses show up from New York City and saying, basically, we will do anything. We just want to provide medical care. Not allowed in. Medical students from the local Buffalo University trying to get in, no. The, the doctors and 
National Guard's medics who they do let in, basically they let them in until you know, 11 and then send them home, and the horrors they witness will scar them for the rest of their life and in fact are so profound, that's how you got to see in the film the guardsmen talking about this horror. They actually, some of them try to go to the Justice Department and say, look, what, do something. Nothing. And so what happens is this is the story that America doesn't hear. And remember, it's not just that it's prisoners that have been killed. It's also the families of guards who have been killed. And their trauma also continues. It's a different kind of trauma, but nevertheless, they're told that the prisoners have killed their loved ones. Didn't happen. They are told that they're going to be taken care of by the state of New York. And agents from the state of New York come to their houses in these horrible days after this event and give Mrs. Cunningham, who has seven children, a check. Tiny check, tiny check. It says, Mrs. Cunningham, you know, this is to tide you over. We know you have a lot of kids, you know, this will help feed them. She's grateful. She cashes it. They're all grateful. The guards in the hospital, they're grateful. The widows, they're grateful. They all cash these checks. What they didn't tell them that was by cashing those checks, they had a quote unquote elected a remedy under New York state law to never be able to sue their employer. So part of what I was able to find was that story. So they're out of luck. They can't sue. They're now living on $142. At, and that's when you got seven kids. Some of them got a lot less than that. They've been lied to. The prisoners have been lied to. The prisoners have been tortured. But as importantly, for this story that I'm about to tell you, the American public has been lied to. And what they've been told is that these people who they were sympathetic to, you know that whole prisoner rights movement thing? And the civil rights movement thing, if they had any sympathy for that, well, you know what, that was just a, that was a lie. These people aren't civil rights activists. These people aren't redeemable. These people are animals. They're thugs. And no sooner do these stories go out, but the telegrams start pouring into Attica, and they start pouring into the letters to the editor everywhere, and politicians are getting phone calls. You should have killed them all. And actually, while you're at it, you should have killed those white liberals that were in there supporting them, like Tom Wicker. And you should have strung up that, that, that radical Bill Kunstler. And they are, they're done. They're done. And those who weren't done were just so appalled. Like some of them, like Arthur Eve, I mean, he was a black state senator and he had really been a champion, you know, fighting against police brutality and, you know, really, a, you know, just this is, you know, his politics were not conservative, but even he believes it. He walks through, he sees that they're torturing Big Black on that table that you saw in that one picture and he thinks that he's castrated Mike Smith and so he thinks that, you know, I mean, I don't, approve of it, this is freaking horrific, but like they think that this whole thing has happened. By the way, to their forever deep guilt and shame. It's one of the reasons why this haunts them for so long. And an entire generation of people who were feeling charitable all of a sudden are not feeling so charitable. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how does this story stick? I mean, surely not, right? Like all these people have been killed and so surely not. Well, What's really incredible about it is that not too many days after this, there is a local coroner who's pretty brave, John Edlin, and he's got all these guys in his bay, the, the, the prisoners and the guards alike, and, and he's doing the autopsies on him, by the way, in very scary conditions, because he's also got all the state troopers there with, you know, standing around in very threatening posture. But he can see they've all been shot. He can see that they haven't had their throat slashed, which is what the story was. He can see that Mike Smith had not been castrated. He knew that. Mike Smith had been shot four times across the abdomen by a fellow corrections officer. And he knew it was a lie. So he actually went public at great danger to himself. I mean, basically, after going public, they hounded him to death, quite, quite literally. So 
he tries to tell the truth. And what does Rockefeller do and his team, what they did in this particular incidence, was they actually tried to discredit him. They called in not one but two other coroners to redo the autopsies, which was really terrible. Then they said, well, if there had been shooting, that's because it was because of the crossfire. They suggested that maybe there were some guns in the yard. Guess what? Not a gun in the yard. Prisoners can't have guns in the yards. Guards don't even have gun in the yard. There were no firearms. And so this is a situation calling for some investigation, right? And there were investigations. There were quite a few of them. There was a whole series of public hearings and something called the McKay Commission, where the Citizens Commission tries to get to the bottom of this. There are congressional hearings that try to get to the bottom of this. There is a federal investigation. This is the one I was referring to that the National Guardsmen reported to. They decide nothing here to see. All of these groups do something to try to figure out what really happened and to assess the carnage. I can now tell you why they couldn't find anything. It's why it took me 13 years to do the book. They couldn't find anything because those things were well, well locked down. And we'll get to that in a minute. But there was one investigation that made a big difference in how this would all happen. And that was the state of New York's own investigation into Attica. This was appointed by Rockefeller. It was given to the state attorney general. This was an investigation that was given a whole lot of money to figure out two things. What were the inmate crimes and what were the trooper crimes taking place at Attica? And let's figure out what happened here. That was their charge. And here's the problem. From the very beginning, the investigators on this case were the same troopers who had gone into the yard shooting. Quite literally, one of the troopers, a guy by the name of Tobias, was quite literally the same person. And he was in charge. So in fact, what this investigation looked like, and it happened immediately on the day of the retaking. Immediately, the troopers that went in were put in charge of the same investigation. And what do they do? They scoop up any incriminating evidence, any evidence that does not look like it might be useful for charging the prisoners. They scoop it up, get rid of it, it's gone. No chalk markings are made of any bodies. No ballistics research is done. They do a series of statements with the troopers. There's ultimately three versions of these statements. <laughs> fiction, fiction, fiction. It's all fiction. I was under attack from a swarm of prisoners, blah, blah, blah. And they make sure that, th that they've been filming all this time. The film, it gets spliced. It gets clipped. The photographs, they get doctored. There's this famous photograph of one of the prisoners, and he's dead, not moving, and he's in a very distinctive position. And then there's another photograph where he's got this big knife in his hand. It's all doctored. One of the, the, the lead troopers, a guy named Hank Williams, he actually ends up burning a bunch of stuff in his fireplace. But America doesn't know any of this. The, the, the Pepper Commission doesn't know this. The McKay Commission doesn't know this. Nobody knows this. They just have what they, they've been given to work with, right? This is the evidence. And what are they given to work with? More baseball bats than you can imagine, all scooped up from the yard to show how threatening the prisoners were. Any kind of makeshift shank, any, anything that could be construed as a weapon is all scooped up in the yard. And they begin the prosecution. And the prosecution is profoundly important to what happens in this nation afterwards, believe it or not. Because what happens is they're supposed to investigate both trooper crimes and inmate crimes. But they're going to do the inmate crimes first. We'll get to the trooper crimes later. And the next thing you know, over 62 inmates, 62 inmates are indicted with riot-related crimes and serious crimes. Even kidnapping in the state of New York, which is what they were charged with for just taking hostage, it was a very, very serious crime. 42 separate felony indictments, two grand juries that sit. 
And this is really important, right? Because the American public all across the nation has first been told that all the violence in Attica is down to the prisoners. They were thugs, they were you know, screw prisoner rights, civil rights, all that kind of stuff. This is why we need law and order, by the way. And now, in and out of courtrooms for the next five years is paraded one man of color from inside of Attica after another one. This is the face of Attica afterwards. Handcuffed, being charged with felony crimes coming out of the, uh, the uprising. And not one single trooper is ever held accountable. Now, there's a whole part of the story that I don't have time to tell you because I want to have time for Q&A, but this is also a really remarkable story of one of the most powerful grassroots legal defense efforts in American history. It, it is, everybody needs to read about this story. It's extraordinary. Young people such as yourselves from all over the country descend upon upstate New York to make sure that these men have a proper defense. Law students, undergraduates, young lawyers, pro bono lawyers, and thus begins truly an extraordinary legal defense effort. It takes up a whole this big chunk of the book. Because there is ultimately a series of trials but they hold the state back. Like no matter how much money they've got, like $900,000 and growing, this free pro bono effort is powerful. They only end up basically with one conviction. And then something else happens in the middle of this, which is a guy inside of the Attica investigation, Malcolm Bell, basically becomes a whistleblower. And he has a conscience. He's actually he supported Goldwater. He was quite conservative. He doesn't, he's no radical, but he could see. He could see the evidence. He could see what was going on. And he could see that these troopers were the everybody had been shot by a trooper, but none of them are going to be held accountable. And this plagues him. It bothers him. And so he tries to go to his bosses and say, let's do something. And what they do is they give immuniz they immunize all the top brass. So then he realizes. He can't get any justice. So he goes to the New York Times. He basically is terrified for his life. He goes undercover because he's seen the evidence. He's seen that the, the films have been spliced. He sees it, and he knew who the shooters were. But nobody else did. No one knew what had happened. No one had any clue what had happened. If you go to Attica today and you ask who killed the hostages, well, maybe not today because maybe they've seen the movie. Maybe, maybe they've finally read the book, but if you ask, you're still going to hear the prisoners killed the hostages. If you go in any small town in America and you ask who killed the hostages, it was the prisoners who killed the hostages, right? So this was a powerful, powerful story. And even though there was a whistleblower, it doesn't move that needle. What it does do, though, is it shuts down the criminal investigation. And that's important. But that's not the end of the story. There's another powerful part of the story, which is that the prisoners say, excuse me, wait a minute. You think you're just going to get rid of the indictments? We suffered horrendous trauma. We are going to hold the state of New York accountable for this. And so they launch a civil suit. And the state of New York spends every dime it can find to fight them. Nothing happened to you. It was, a, it was at worst, it was a fraternity hazing. No, you can't show the pictures of Big Black. This is him in his own closing statement in the civil case. They ultimately, it takes them 30 years to finally get some measure of justice before the court, where a jury awards Big Black on the outside of the damages $4 million. And David Brozig, one of the lesser injured prisoners, but still horrifically injured, he's going to set the low end of the damages for this class of $75,000. So they finally, after all this time, they get some measure of justice. And then by this time, Rockefeller's lawyers have gotten him out of the case. And it, there's only one man left standing, and the low-level deputy warden who's left standing at the end of this, who gets to hold the bag of the civil case. But 
at the end of the day, the state of New York says, guess what? Nope, eh, not so fast. We're going to overturn the ruling. You're not really a class. You need to now go back and sue everybody as an individual. These guys are sick. They're traumatized. They're dying already. And so they go and they ultimately settle with this amazing judge by the name of Teleska, who allows them finally to tell their story on the record. I want to just point this out because they do refuse to be silenced in this story. And the guards also. They have, <laughs> they've got their own traumas. They have their own very complicated story. They don't stand with the prisoners when they should have at the end. But they, too, will go to the state of New York and get a settlement, ultimately. It doesn't happen until 2005, 2006. But they, too, they still haven't got an apology. The state of New York still says nothing happened. They still won't admit culpability, but they at least got some financial damages. So what does that have to do with why we're here? Because part of this is about Attica. To see the documents that there was a deliberate no ultimatum given, to see that after, in the days and months after this retaking, there's a series of secret meetings that are held in Rockefeller's pool house. And who's there? The head of the Attorney General's office, Rockefeller's team, and the head of the state police, who, by the way, are supposed to be being investigated, remember, because that's what the, <laughs> that's what the Attorney General's office is supposed to be doing, is investigating them. And they get their story straight. And it happens over a series of these subsequent weekends, and a document gets produced out of that called Confidential Memo in Attica, which I found. And it's, it's just alarming, because it makes clear that they are not going to let the state police go down for this. And indeed, when the Attica investigation shuts down, coincides with when Rockefeller is sitting in his confirmation hearings to be vice president. Because the only thing that anyone wants to talk about is, but what about Attica? And the last thing that could happen at that point was to have all those troopers indicted. And so the governor then at the time, Hugh Carey, basically says, you know what? It's been a mistake all around. It's been a big disaster all around. It's been kind of a flawed investigation. It's just kind of a big hot mess. So let's just close the book on Attica. And the cover-up that I finally began to appreciate it and understand was not just some like, you know, cloak and dagger cover. No, it was quite logical. It made sense. This had been a disaster. How are we going to explain that we've killed two guards in our own prison system? How are we going to explain that all those people went in there with guns blazing and not a single one of them had been trained in riot control and half of them had never shot a 351 rifle before? How are we going to explain this? Well, how are we going to explain it is we're not going to explain it. And we're going to let, for example, the trooper who shot out Kelly, Kenny Malloy's eyes, we're going to make sure he's no longer on the force within two days of the uprising. We're going to make sure that there is no film. We're going to make sure there are no pictures. And ultimately, until 2016, no one had a clue who those troopers were. And I happened upon the evidence to be able to name them. And to really un lay out the drama. And it is a drama. I mean, my book is this much about the uprising, this, then the criminal trials, then the civil trials, and then what happens afterwards. This is the story that goes on today. The state of New York still hasn't opened the archives, as I mentioned to you. It's still an ongoing fight to get the records open. There's a grassroots fight still to actually close Attica, because it is a trauma site. But it remains a maximum security prison. And it remains one of the most brutal maximum security prisons. And so the importance of Attica is twofold, right? It's about why it is that a nation in 1971 thinks that the death penalty is a bad idea, thinks that maybe we should start considering decarceration, slowly is lurching its way to trying to understand and get its head around, and who am I talking about? White America, civil rights. And 
all of a sudden it's like, oh no, mm -mm. nope, time to shut it down, time to close it down, it has gone too far because if this is what civil rights looks like and if this is what prisoner rights look like, no effing way are we gonna do that. And you start to see bills being passed in the name of Attica. And you start seeing prisons clamp down in the name of Attica. And the warden, I mean, sorry, the commissioner Oswald makes a proposal while he was still commissioner to the Rockefeller administration. And he says, you know what? I think we need to start building something. And he called them maxi maxi prisons where we're going to put the worst of the worst. Well, they didn't make the maxi maxi prison, but what they did do was build the supermax prison all over the country. And Rockefeller says, well, here's the other way. We're not putting up with this lawlessness anymore. We're also going to start the drug war. Attica happens in 1971, 1973 with Nixon. The drug war is endorsed. New York is the ground zero of the drug war. But by two years later, Michigan has the 650 lifer law. You're caught with 650, 650 grams of cocaine, which I'm no mathematician, but 650 grams is not all that much. You do an automatic life sentence. So Attica becomes the way that people justify a war on crime that had begun five years earlier, six years earlier, really had been brewing for a while, but it became the battle cry after Attica. And every bit of it was a lie. That's not what happened at Attica. That's not why Attica happened. And the torture and the trauma that the men in Attica endured was not just borne by them, and you got to see that story in Stanley's film, but it has been borne by every other subsequent generation that has now entered these supermax prisons, these maximum security facilities, these juvenile facilities. We now have 77,000 juveniles in prison in this country, compared to Finland, for example, which has four. And Attica is part of that story. But Attica is also a story of hope and struggle. Because the people who had been the most traumatized, the most tortured, the worst, had suffered, lost everything, do not let the most high paid lawyers, the biggest legal offense in American history, stand. And it took them 35 years, ultimately, but they still came back and said, you're going to hear our stories. And of course, Stanley's book, or Stanley's film, is so beautiful because they actually, to the world now, tell those stories. Not just on the page in my book, but with, with their presence. So thank you for listening. <laughs> So um, I'd like Stanley to come forward, join us. Um, and so we're going to turn it over to the audience to ask questions of both Heather and Stanley. Again, thank you, Heather, for being here. Thank you, Stanley. Um, I think we have plenty of context now for <laughs> uh, how this unfolded and Great. why it matters. So I'm sure there's questions. And um, I think there's a microphone uh, on either corner. If you have a question, raise your hand, and the microphone will go to you. Right there. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm a professor here at Dartmouth, and I was part of uh, the co-organizing committee for this screening. You know, Thank I you. had no idea. Um, I, I had no one had any idea the detail you've shared today in the film, they're just chilling uh, and yet hopeful. Um, I don't have a question, I just really want to thank you. Uh, if I could give you a standing ovation, well I can, right? I mean, you know, I mean, thank you <laughs> thank so you. much. But I guess my question is this for you, Heather. I'm, you know, retribution is out there. Um, what are you suffering as a consequence of this? Have you been targeted? Um, and you say that this is a hopeful story in the end. Is it? Well, here, let me, and that's a great question, and, and I will answer both of them. And thank you for your, for your kind comments. 
Uh, I'll start with the second one first. The reason why I say it's helpful is not because we're there. It's not because uh, justice has been done. That's not the hopeful part. It, it's, and in fact, as the, the, the men said after they even got their settlement ultimately from the state of New York, they said, this isn't justice, this isn't close to justice, but it's the closest thing to justice we're gonna get right now. So that's only partially, I guess, the hopeful part, the, the fact that no matter how much money and power there was leveled against them, they were still able to stand up and, we, and tell us the stories that we're now hearing, right, and can take forward generationally. But it's also that Attica remains the, the, the call uh, for folks on the inside to, to, to do something differently, to stand up, and it remains uh, inspirational. So in 2016, there was a you know, spread out of uh, strikes across the nation's prison system. Same thing in 2018. And you know, it continues, like these voices from the inside. And what gives them hope is this idea that collectively um, that matters and that we can rein in this prison system. But it is contingent on understanding what happened, right? So today, when people, up, when people have a prison strike, you know, nobody's on the outside making sure that they're okay when it's over. No, because they don't know about you know, Attica. They don't know what the consequences of this are. So it's hopeful as in future hopeful, and hopeful as in no, no matter how powerful you are, you don't decide it. You don't get to decide the future. But it's not over by any stretch of the imagination. And as for retribution, that's an interesting question because you know, um, to my surprise, I mean, I've definitely gotten my share of hostility, particularly, you can imagine I gave this talk in, um, in Batavia, New York, and the whole front row was full of the state troopers and the, the guards. So yeah, I've had my share. I actually felt like I needed security at that talk and have at others. But interestingly, I've gotten so many letters also from, from police officers, from guards who basically say, yep, that's what happened, and you know, uh, glad someone finally said what really happened, or traumatized letters. Like, you know, uh, we've got to remember the reason we know half of what we know about went on, what went on in Diard, half of it is from the prisoners, but we didn't even know some of that until they were able to actually tell their stories. Some of it we actually learned from the fellow troopers who were then brought to the stand, and they all pleaded the fifth, but a few of them were so horrified by what they had been part of and seen, not that they had done it, but that they'd been part of that you know, phalanx that went in, that they, they were the ones who were really scared. They came forward, and one of them, for example, testified that all the guys, all the troopers, when they went in, they took off their identifying badges. That's how we know that. That was one of their own that basically reported that. So I've gotten an interesting amount of stuff since the book's been written, uh, I mean, the coroner sent me the autopsy reports. I've got, I got one guy. Uh, the the coroner's Edlin's secretary, some relative of hers, sent me like a whole stash of stuff. One of the trooper's sons, the trooper's now dead, but his son sent me a, a stash of his of his dad's papers. So it's kind of it's an Ooh. interesting, surprising mix of what came from it. I kind of want to pick off where you pick up where you left off there about um, material and source material. Mm -hmm. So, as a history major, like I've done some archival research, and one of the things you touched on that I think is really interesting is the serendipity of archival research. And sometimes you just get lucky, and you mentioned that. Um, so, I'd love to hear more about how you found that cache of documents, um, and then also in that vein, your overall methodology. Like, how did you go about filling in the gaps in the archive that still exists now? Um, did you like rely on oral histories, things like that? Mm -hmm. um, so, boy, I, I wish there was kind of a linear and straightforward answer to that question. I have to first confess that when I decided I wanted to do this book, I was so naive. I thought I would go into the archive and I would order box 12, folder two, and then I would sit there and I would you know, do my research and I would tell the story. And when I realized that I wasn't gonna get those archives, I have to say I 
was completely flabbergasted and kind of set on my ear, like, what am I going to do now? So that became the journey of just trying to figure out where all the stuff may be. And that was in part just trying to be creative. Like, for example, the guards were unionized. And so I thought to myself, well, I wonder if any of them filed workman's compensation claims. Because if they did, then in there is going to be some details on what happened in the yard to them that day. And, you know, like try to figure out, like, were they a veteran? Does the Department of, you know, Veterans Affairs have any documents on this? I mean, I literally was scraping from every pot. And that was good for me, because if you're a history major, you, you start to realize we rely too much on the archive. We just assume that it's all going to be there for us. But of course, it's curated what's going to be there for us. As much as I love archivists, and I'm dear Dearly a fan of archivists, you know, they know that what, what they've been handed over is what people are, it's okay for people to see, right? So that was a struggle. And it, had, it, had it not been for the survivors finally being willing to talk to me, which was its own journey, you know? I mean, I, I personally come from a mixed family. I grew up in Detroit. I mean, my own personal story is not the way I look. I, people didn't want to talk to me who were, who were on the inside. Too many people were willing to talk to me whose stories were horrifying. I had to like navigate how to be a storyteller in that space and make sure that people's stories were being honored. It took a lot, I mean, it, that's one of the other reasons it took so long. Also, I had a, a random experience where the attorney general who thinks Attica's over because they've settled with the state says, well, here's the, here's the entire, here's the entire uh, in, index of everything the state of New York has. I'm like, what? So I knew what to file freedom of information requests for. And for a little while, they were kind of trickling in, and they were developing some stuff until they figured out who I was, and then that shut down. But ultimately, it was, the, it was just the desire of people to finally tell what happened that made it possible for me, and the luck, as you say, the serendipity of just coming across stuff that I will quickly tell you that story, but I still it, it still haunts me because it's never going to happen again. I'm doing a book now on the move bombing. It's never going to happen like this again. But I had been calling every upstate New York courthouse because I knew the criminal trials that happened there, and I knew that wherever the criminal trials were, that was going to be ground zero, right, for the stories, like the depositions and the you know and the 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 cross examination. Who has these files? I don't have Attica files. I don't have it. Nobody has anything to do with Attica. And one day, I get a call. Actually, there was two incidents like this. I'll tell you the first one first. I get a call, and it's from, this, from the Erie County Courthouse, which is in Buffalo. And, the, and this lady says, I think we've got some Attica records here. Now, let me back up and say, at this time, I lived in North Carolina. I had three kids. I was making $36,000 a year. I'm like, to my husband, I'm going to Attica. Like, we're getting, I'm getting a ticket. I'm going. Because I'm like, what? You've got records. But I could only afford to stay there two days. And this is relevant to my story because I go in there and in the back room, in this dusty back room, and there's, this is not an archive, let's just be clear. This is just a, it's a storage room. And I go back there where they take me and floor to ceiling is Attica Records. I mean, just floor to ceiling. And I just kind of stand there and I'm like, what is this? But I don't want to let on that I'm excited. So I'm like, you know, like, oh, OK, well, this is interesting. I'll, you know, I got no place to sit. There's not a chair. There's nothing. There's no desk. There's nothing. And I just start to pull stuff out, because it's a blizzard of papers. There's no rhyme or reason to this stuff. It's a mess. And everything I start to pull out, it was like serendipity, like you know, the hand of God like directing me, man. I kept pulling out incredible things, like trooper statements I had never seen before and you know internal investigations. That's how I found out there was an FBI informant in the Attica defense. And I figure out what her name is and I figure out who her handler is. I tell that story in the book. And I figure out how she's feeding all of the defense strategies to the state of New York and the FBI. Like these are the, these are the things I'm pulling out. And then I pull out the whistleblowing document of Malcolm Bell. And there were only three made one went to the governor, one went to the head of the Attica investigation, and one, I gather, must have gone to an Attica judge because there it was. And then I got scared. I'm like, it's 62 pages plus an appendices. There's only three copies on the planet. How am I going to get this out of here? And my students today say, well, why don't you just use your cell phone? Why don't you like scan it? 
Okay, let's be clear. This is 2006. There is no iPhone till 2010. I ain't scanning nothing. I've got a flip phone that makes like crazy characters. And so I gotta figure out how to get it out of there. I'm thinking, well, maybe I can make some copies, but I don't wanna look too excited. So I go out and I said to the lady, you know, is it possible maybe that I can make some copies? And I'm you know, also calling my husband. I'm like, I, 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 how am I gonna stay an extra day? He's like, you know, can't, you know, we can only afford a hotel two days. Okay, I gotta get copies. She says, well, actually, yeah, you can, you can probably do copies here. And then I realize it's $1.50 a page because it's a legal situation, right? I'm like, oh, this is never going to work. So then I say to her, well, is there a way that maybe I can work something out? You know, she's like, well, let me have you talk to the clerk of court. I have still up to this day a lot of guilt about this because the clerk of court is this elected position He's a politician. He's very like suave, and he like looks good. He's got a suit. He's very natty and very nice guy. And I go up to his big office with the big desk, and I might have said I was a history teacher, not professor. I might have said I was working on a paper, not a book. I'm not really sure what I said, uh, but what I sort of said was, you know, I can't stay here. I got to go home to my kids. Is there any way that I can just make some copies? He says, well, I think we can do that. So, so what do you think would be fair? And I said, I don't know, like maybe like $200 for like anything, I, as much as I could copy. And he says, yeah, I think that's reasonable. This is important because I wrote a check. So I have evidence that I actually paid for this. And then I'm walking out and he says, so bring all your copies to, let's say her name is Marge, out in the, I'm like, what? Because you don't have to be a legal scholar to know when it says in the special grand jury in the state of New York or when it's, <laughs> like, and I know that the minute they see what I'm going to find that they're going to shut it down. So I go back in there and I start pulling stuff out, what I want mixed in with a whole bunch of stuff that I don't want. And I walk out and I have a stack like this big and she looks at me like she's going to kill me because she's got, because then I look at her and I'm even more horrified because it's one of these deals where you lift up the lid and you go, and I'm thinking we're going to be here all day. And so every time she got close to one of those documents, I just start talking like your friend. I'm like, so is that your daughter? Blue eyes. Who is it? Your son? Your daughter? Who has that? I mean, I am talking like a mate. Where'd you get that shirt? Target? So cute. I wonder if they have it in my size. She thinks I'm a lunatic and she just wants to get me the hell out of there. So that's how I got the first set and then how I was able to figure out who were the how, what the crimes were like, who had done what. And then the second time was that the troopers had been sitting on a cache of records that they then donated to the state of New York's library, some low-level trooper who didn't know what they had. And they called me, I had a, did a piece of the New York Times, and so they said, oh, well, this woman's working on it. They brought me in to look at these, and that's when I found, like, held up L.D. Barclay's clo bloody clothes. It was like really, I mean, I'm going through the boxes, looking at the actual physical detritus of this. Those records are now disappeared. Yeah. They're not there anymore. Um, right before the book came out, which was embargoed, because I was so terrified the, the state police would shut it down that they would put an injunction against the book, that um, nobody saw the book. And a reporter called me about, I don't know, maybe three weeks before the book came out. He says, so. I hear you've got Attica documents. I hear you've got some, you know, really, uh, I don't know, what did he, what's the word, smoking gun or something, documents. And my heart sank because I thought, oh boy, like the book's embargoed and I'll be damned if this reporter is going to get this document. Like, you know, I've been doing this book for 13 years. I want it to be in the bigger context. Don't just, you know, don't just publish the document. So he, and he says, so, but I can't lie. And, you know, he says, so Erie County Chorus? I said, yeah. I said, but, you know, I said, do me a favor. I said, just tread carefully because my goal is when the book comes out to be able to identify where all these are and then have someone actually go and get them all and preserve them, right? I don't want to tip anybody off. So he calls me like two weeks later and he's furious. He says, there, were, there are no Attica documents. What are you talking about? I'm like, let me guess. You called them up, and you said you're here to see these Attica documents. And by the time you got there, they didn't have any. And he said, well, yeah, they don't have any. I said, oh, yes, they do. And I have the check, and I have the copies, and I have everything. But no, you can't see my copies until the book is out. But yeah, they're gone. So that's a very long-winded way. Sorry, that was so long. <laughs> could, 
could you two talk about the process where you came together a little bit more? And in the film, we see these men talking, who you must be aware of, Heather, mm -hmm. uh, from your research, and just a bit more of that process. And and I was struck by seeing the film of the bravery of these people, and, and well, the, the anger too, right? I mean, that, that they wanted to tell their story finally. Mm -hmm. So just a little bit of how you came together. You obviously wrote the book first. Stanley, you had heard about it, and just right. share with us a little bit about that, that right. process. Um, well, Heather's, your memory is a lot better than, than mine, but um, you know, I, I read the book. I wanted to do a film on on Attica, and um, we started talking. And I can't even remember what year that was. Well, it was it was we were we were talking about maybe actually optioning the book, and we couldn't do it because yeah. it was tied up, and it was really complicated. But then I basically went to them and said, "I am going to help <laughs> with this project yeah. somehow." Yeah, it was. It but was, by then, you were yeah. already well into it. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. So. Um, you know, Heather had her agents, and and I I, I called the agents. I yeah, think it was, I I call what, what was it was like Paramount or somebody. It was, was Sony TriStar. So, that had Sony the right TriStar, to it. and I called the people at, at Sony TriStar, and I said, well, and they wanted to make a feature film, and I said, okay, well, well, we want to make a documentary, and it was a young woman on the phone, and she said something like, documentary, what's that? <laughs> I, I said, I said, you know, I, I think it will only complement the feature film. You and know, I was saying to them the same thing, but you know, it'll it'll complement. But she's like, what's that? And and then so we kind of shelved it for a while, and then we got the money to make the film. And I came back to Heather, and to our surprise, she was like, Yeah, I'm just going to do it. I'm I'm just going to work with you and and, and forget them. And we're like, okay, fine, <laughs> that's great. Uh, and so that's how you know, we started working together. But the real gift of what you're asking, tell him about the, the interviews and I mean, just the, the magic of, he had an amazing researcher doing the footage and then you know, Tracy tracking yeah. down these interviews, his you know, producer and co-director on this. I mean, it's just incredible what they did, getting these guys to talk. Yeah, I mean, they just did an incredible job of finding people, of talking to people, of trying to get them to um, trust us. You know, that, that's just a huge thing, um, to trust what we were doing. I think one of the things that, that happens nowadays is that, you know, because of the internet, um, people can easily look at you know what some of the other films that we've done and they know what what we what we do, um, and we just said you know that that we want to give them a chance to tell their story and we really want just want want to do that and that's um, that was the start and um, and we found incredible people. I said before you know um, a lot of times people talk about the great interviews that we do, but really, you know, we just kind of open it up. We ask one question. What happened? Then, yeah, what happened? <laughs> like, what did you see? You know, and people just start start talking because so many of the people that are that are in in the film have never told their stories. You know, um, unfortunately, Big Black had passed away, um, and so many of the people in in the film had never had a chance. I mean, even. As I think I said last night, you know, John Johnson, the, the mm -hmm. r reporter, um, you know, he, he, nobody ever asked him about Attica mm -hmm. um, and, to, and like what he saw and what he felt. Um, and so that. Uh, but even that, your, your team was so dogged in tracking these people down because I can remember I had a, this long conversation with Tracy about John Johnson and I said, you know, some, you got so we got to find him, like talk to him, and he was hard to find. Right. He was somebody who'd been an ABC reporter, and he refused <laughs> to print the throat slashing story. Yeah. And because he refused to do it, he was what just kind of drummed out black, of it. He was he, blacklisted absolutely. for a while at, at, at ABC. Um, and she found and, him. And Tracy found him, and she said, you know, she said, uh, you know, John Johnson's living in New Jersey, um, and he's really hesitant. You know, and you know, maybe you should call him Stanley. And I called him, and I didn't have to BS, right? For anybody that's old enough, John Johnson was the man, yep. right? He was the man. He was the first kind of black reporter in New York, and he was always buttoned down with a cute suit and afro. And I was like, 
John Johnson. <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe I'm talking to you. Oh my God. <laughs> I'd have to fake it, you know. Yeah. And uh, he's, you know, he, he said, okay, I'll do it. And that was just, you know, an, an amazing point. I should also say, um, um, you know, just getting the people uh, f for the interviews. When we, we um, when we did Clarence Jones, you know, who ends the film with, you know, I never, ever, 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 ever forget Attica. Um, he, he had come to New York for something. And, you know, at this point, he's like 88 years old or something. And we had breakfast with him. And he starts telling stories. And he just remembers so much. And, um, you know, I said, you know, um, would you agree to be interviewed? And... He said, yeah, of course, Stanley. <laughs> Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And the hair still stands up on the back of my neck. Because at that point, we were like, OK, we got it. <laughs> yeah. We got it. You know, Because he was just so amazing. And, and he had such a great memory. And he had such passion for the story. We knew at that point that we had a couple of, uh, of, of inmates from the yard, mm -hmm. the former prisoners. And we knew that there was some footage. And now to have one of the observers that, that was still around, you know, just we, we knew that, that we had it. And, and then we just, I don't know, we, we just found so many other people that, that uh, you know, um, I, thought, I thought most of the observers would have passed away because they were older than the, than the people in the yard. But they were, you know, we had, had uh, a, a whole core group that were alive. And, and again, you know, for everybody, for, and everybody that experienced Attica, no matter what, it was just... Um, Still haunting. Yeah, it was like haunting, and it was this memory, and it was just so important in their lives. And to have somebody, you know, asking them to just tell their story and, and not, you know, we don't want a two-minute soundbite. You know, we got all day. Just tell tell mm -hmm. us what it like, what it was like, you know, what it looked like, what it sounded like, what it smelled like. You know, um, mm -hmm. that was, uh, you know, they were incredible. The it, well, and also it, it bears mentioning that as you got closer to the 50th, the men who had endured Attica uh, had begun to come together for this 50th commemoration. And so as, the, as you were moving to the rough cut, we were, they were meeting regularly and um, I was working with their team. We were going to do this big event in New York for the 50th. I mean, COVID ended up just yeah. messing so much up. But that had brought some of them together for the first time since they had originally gotten that settlement, which was in 2000. So a lot of them had not seen each other, and they're kind of reconvening. Some of the guys were up in Buffalo, some of them in Rochester, some of them in New York City. And so they had kind of also reconnected. And they became, I think, really kind of a, I mean, there was a little bit of, you know, who's, who's going to be the star of the show kind of thing. <laughs> but there was also a lot of real camaraderie, I think, that came out of that 50th that you can kind of feel in the film, where they're all in it to make sure that story finally gets told, because a lot of people have died. Um, I did, you asked about method, I did conversation, I called them conversations with people, because in history we have oral history, which is very official, and I didn't want to do oral history because I didn't, you know, the truth was no one was going to tell me half the stories without, if it was too, too uh, rigid, right? But some of those people were so traumatized. The observer, Tom Wicker, I will never forget going to his house in Vermont. And he just sobbed. And he felt so much guilt that on the day of the retaking, he kept saying over and over again, I just, there was something I should have been able to do. I should have seen this coming. I, you know, I should have been able to stop it. I, you know, I, 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 this haunts me to this day. And he died before my book came out and before the film came out. And I was haunted by the fact that I was never able to show him something that I hope would have given him some measure of peace, which is you couldn't have stopped this. Like this was, this was decided. They were never going to let this thing settle. And now that you know this, now that you see the behind the scenes, now that you understand what was really happening, which is that basically had it not been for, you know, uh, John Dunn, they would have gone in on day two. Had it not been, or, you know, day three. And, it, it, and so many people never got to have a final, they never got to see the full story, right? Yeah. And they never got to hear, they never got to tell their story on film. So it's really heartbreaking, actually. 
Yeah, uh, John Dunn, who's the senator, um, we interviewed him. We, we, did, we first did a sample reel, and we interviewed him for the sample reel. And then when we came back to d do the actual film, we wanted to interview him again. And we interviewed him again, and he was very, very sick uh, with cancer, and he died a week later. Yeah. But, you know, he was like, you know, just come and, and do the interview. You know, I'm sick, and, but just come and do the interview. And we spent a lot of time because he looked so different in the two interviews, and we, it's, it's just a real technical thing, but we knew we couldn't cut them together, like back to back. Mm -hmm. But as long as you only saw him one way at any time, it was fine. I mean, he was strong, and, and you know, he mm -hmm. sounded great, but you know, I mean, that's how much he wanted to tell the story. I mean, it's amazing you know, how much the observers and the news people and, and, and the other people who weren't prisoners uh, were affected by Attica mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they felt that their their charge was to prevent this mass killing. That 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 their their charge as observers were to go was to go in and f figure out a way to settle this thing. Yeah, and they couldn't do it, and they just couldn't do it, and and uh, they carry a lot of guilt. And they had guilt that it was all unpunished too, not understanding why, you know, not understanding how it was that all those people were unscathed in this and remain unscathed. I mean, there's no statute of limitations on murder, but the, but the, the, the evidence, I mean, it's, it's all so damaged. Everything has been damaged. There's no way to ever really, if, if you believe that the justice should happen through the criminal justice system, that would never be a possibility. And, and, for a lot of people, that was really hard to get their heads around. Like, there's never going to really be any justice from this. But the telling of the story became its own way, I think, of certainly in the film of, you know, telling, getting some measure of justice just to make sure everyone knew what really happened. Yeah, so um, I was going to, oh, I, I was going to start by saying, so let me be naive for a minute. But... So I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, and then you reminded me, yeah, so you carry became governor and I can't remember all the governors since you carry, but you know, I mean, certainly I remember Cuomo and, and, and while I haven't lived in New York in 40 something years now, um, you know, there's, from what I read, um, you know, there's a large, I mean, progressives have some political mm -hmm. power, certainly in the city, apparently on the city council. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a black mayor you know, Adams, um, and uh, you would think that, I mean, Attica was a big deal. I'm old enough to have been, you know, somewhat contemporaneous in my consciousness. And um, so you would think that, that, that people would want to, somebody in position of power or some people in a position of power would, would want to, you know, you know, archive all this stuff. They, yeah. they would, they, you know, nobody has any interest in protecting Nelson Rockefeller anymore. And uh, nobody has any interest in protecting what happened, you know, the, I mean, the racism that, that was so virulent that existed, that was so, so dominant in white culture in 1970s, we could talk about today in racism, but it's yeah. changed. There's something different happening. You know, so nobody has any interest. This, I don't see why anybody would have any interest and trying to keep that information yeah. that you're talking about from the public in 2023. It's a great, it's, so this is the so head scratcher. That. Yeah, this is the, believe, not only does it mystify you, but it mystifies like, you know, Senator Myrie and various people in New York who are trying still to get the records open. And the only two remote explanations that I have, because no one will actually say it, Actually, there's three. One of them is human nature, which is they have no idea what's in there, and nobody wants to be the administration, the AG, the person that opens Pandora's box. So there's the, uh, it's probably nothing, but I don't want to be that guy, right? I don't want to be the person that opens Pandora's box. So I think there's a bit of that going on, even if they don't remember Attica or know Attica. The police union in New York is massively strong. And every time, this is reason two, every time we've tried to get them open, what has prevented them from being open is the police union. And what they say is it's a privacy matter, and they basically have fought it every step along the way. 
And then the third issue, I think, is really that the AG's office has a very complicated relationship with this story. So Eric Schneiderman went very publicly that he was going to open the records. But the reality was, at that point, we were only talking about essentially opening up part three of a report called the Meyer Report. It wasn't even the documents. It wasn't even the records. And even that, the AG's office insisted, would be redacted within an inch of its life. So part of it is that it, it's, they, there's no statute of limitations on murder. 39 people were shot to death, and the torture went on and on, and they, they could, there could still be a civil rights case. We have opened up civil rights cases for Southern cases. It could happen. People don't necessarily want that. But in fact, what the, what the survivors have said they want, both the guards and the prisoners have said what they want, is a Truth and Reconciliation Committee. That's what they really want, but nobody wants to so be that person. James, I mean, you're reminding me of names and people that are, you know, but Letitia James, I, I, mean, I mean, I think of her as, you know. I mean, there are people who want to. Who wouldn't shy away from this, and, and I don't even ask from the point of view of yeah. vengeance at this point. I mean, who might ask, but. Just knowledge. I mean, nevertheless, yeah. right, but I just think it needs to be archived. You're absolutely right. This is, this is our history. Yep. You know, and I would think people, people like Letitia James could buy into that, you know, and, and she's got the power to say to somebody, get everything out there that's in every nook and cranny and put it all in one place. You know, they had a thing down in, when I was in New York a couple of years ago, and, and I was able to go down to it by City Hall, and, and they had in some little office, some little building somewhere, some. They were showing, for anybody who wants to come in, all the surveillance film that the New York, New York City Police Department had done on all the demonstrations. Yeah. You know, and you could just stand there for, and it was a loop. Just going around. I, I mean, so. Well, I'm hopeful. I, I will tell you, I'm very hopeful, but I will also tell you that right now, New York State is really being, and, and you know this too, Stanley, right? Being criminal justice is a super hot button issue. You've got some people that want to close down Rikers and shine the light and let it be known, but you've got some really powerful guards organizations and police organizations that are absolutely not having it. And that's the ground zero of that battle. There are plenty of state senators. There are members of the AG's office who would be perfectly fine opening them up. And, there's, and every time they turn, there is massive resistance. But your point, this is a public place. It's a public prison. These, every bit of that investigation was paid for by public dollars. Every bit of that was paid for by the state of New York, citizens of the state of New York. It's outrageous. Yeah. So. I'm getting a signal. It is, I think, time to wrap it up. So I want to thank everybody uh, that has attended. And I definitely want to thank Heather and Stanley for the two days of enlightenment um, and consciousness. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Heather, that was great. <laughs>